Testing, one, two, three, three, two, one. Testing, testing, testing. One, two, three, three, two, one. All right. Welcome to Empty Cross Ministries Daily Devotional Time. I'm Brother David. The name of the program is King James Version Exposed. That is KJV Exposed. Because we use the King James Version, we look at each verse, break it down, bring it to life, and expose the meaning. <clears throat> Today we're going to be looking at Micah chapter 5. We're going to be going to be talking about Christ's first advent and Christ's second coming. Through the words of Micah. Before we get to that, I would encourage you to read along with and follow along with Empty Cross Ministries daily Bible reading plan that can be found on our website at www.EmptyCrossMinistries.com, Empty Cross Ministries Facebook page, Empty Cross Ministries group Facebook page, my own personal Facebook page, as well as on our uh, Twitter account. I would, excuse me, <clears throat> if you follow along with a reading plan, you will find a passage from the Old Testament and a passage from the New Testament every day. It will take maybe 10-15 minutes of reading time to get through that. If you do that, you will be blessed and encouraged very greatly. Let's open up here with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Father, we thank you for all the ways that you provide for us. Father, we ask that you be with those who are facing any financial difficulties. Be with those who are facing addiction issues. Be with those who are facing any kind of health issue whether it be physical, mental, emotional, or spiritual. Just put your healing touch upon them. Father, be with those who are facing the loss of a loved one. Just make your presence known to them in ways that only you can do, in ways that they can see, hear, feel, and understand. Father, thank you for all that you do and provide for us. Forgive us and we fall short of your glory. We come before you seeking your grace, seeking your face, seeking your forgiveness, Lord. We know your justice is always tempered with mercy and your decrees, laws, and commands are true and right and just. Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for us, to take the place, to take our place on that cross. It's in his name that we pray these things. Amen. As I said, we're going to be looking at Micah chapter 5. The first advent and the second advent, this is coming from, this is God's words, God's words being spoken through the mouth of Micah. Micah chapter 5 verse 1 reads, Now gather thyself in troops, O daughter of troops. He hath laid siege against us. They shall smite the judge of Israel with the rod upon the cheek. Judge of Israel, judge of Israel, who will be smitten with the rod upon the cheek is not a reference to the humiliation of Jesus. The reference is to the deportation of Israel's rulers, perhaps especially King Zedekiah, and to his shameful treatment at the hands of Babylon. Look at 2 Kings chapter 25. Smite the judge of Israel, a reference to the capture of King Zedekiah at the hands of Babylon in 586 B.C. Look at 2 Kings chapters 24 and 25. We know that Israel and Jerusalem in Israel had been besieged and had been taken and had been scattered. They certainly had been humiliated like a slap on the face. Those in authority felt to the same fate, fell to the same fate as the everyday citizen of the country. Verses 2 through 4. This passage looked forward to Christ's first advent in chapter 5, verse 2. Then we have an intervening time in chapter 5, the first part of verse 3, and beyond to the second advent. In chapter 5, the second part of verse 3 and verse 4. Micah, verse 5, Micah chapter 5 verse 2 reads, 
but thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Bethlehem is distinguished as Ephratah in the land of Judah. It was the hometown of King David. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 12. It was the hometown of King David and the birthplace and the birthplace of Jesus. Look at Matthew chapter 2, verse 5. The name Bethlehem means house of bread because the area was a grain producing region in Old Testament times. The name Ephratah means fruitful. It differentiates it from the Galilean town by the same name. The town, known for her many vineyards and olive orchards, was small in size, but not in honor. The reaction to the question of the wise man indicates that the Jews believed this prophecy revealed the birthplace of the Messiah. Ruler in Israel is a king from David's line, from of old, from everlasting. This speaks of eternal God's incarnation in the person of Jesus Christ. It points to his millennial reign as king of kings. Look at Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. From everlasting clearly indicates the eternality of the one who is, be, who is to be born at Bethlehem. Thus, Micah's prophecy adds to that of his contemporary Isaiah, for Isaiah predicts the means of the ruler's birth, and Micah predicts the place of his birth. Bethlehem, where Jesus was born, is just outside of Jerusalem, about five miles. It is a small village. At the time of the deepest sorrow of God's people, they were under Roman rule. God sent the Savior of the world. He was their Messiah. He was their King. He is our Savior. Notice that Jesus is everlasting. He is the beginning and the end. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 reads, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Micah chapter 5 verse 3 reads, Therefore will he give them up until the time that she which travaileth hath brought forth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. Give them up, a reference to the interval between Messiah's rejection at his first advent and his second advent, during the times of the Gentiles, when Israel rejects Christ and is under the domination of enemies. Regathering of the remainder of his brethren did not occur at the first advent, but is slated for the second advent. Look at Isaiah chapter 10, verses 20 through 22, and Isaiah chapter 11, verses 11 through 16. Nor can return speak of Gentiles, since it cannot be said they returned to the Lord. Rather, the context of chapter 5, verses 3 and 4 is millennial and cannot be made to fit the first advent. Thus, she who is in labor must denote the nation of Israel. Look at Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 through 6. She which travaileth hath brought forth, refers to Mary, giving birth to the baby Jesus at Bethlehem. This is saying that God's people will be controlled by others until the Virgin Mary brings forth the Christ child. Christ will bring in his kingdom and all who will believe the true family of Abraham will be his family. This includes those who are spiritual Israel and physical Israel. Micah chapter 5 verse 4 reads, And he shall stand and feed in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall abide, for now 
shall he be great unto the ends of the earth. The millennial rule of Christ sitting upon the throne of David. Look at Isaiah chapter 6 verse 13. Jesus is the ruler spoken of here. Who is their Messiah? Jesus is spoken of as the good shepherd. He feeds all of his flock. Jesus was not just for the Hebrews. 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 10 reads, For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. The feeding here is speaking of feeding on the word of the Lord. No one can take the believers away from Jesus. The word abide means continually live. John, the Gospel of John chapter 5 verse 24 reads, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation but is passed from death unto life. The Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 27 through 30 read, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Verses 5 through 6. The Assyrian. Assyria. Assyria. God's instrument against Israel in 722 B.C. and Judah. Sennacherib siege in 701 B.C. is here used as representative of enemy nations in opposition to the Lord. Micah chapter 5 verse 5 reads, And this man shall be the peace when the Assyrian shall come into our land, and when he shall tread in our palaces, then shall we raise against him seven shepherds and eight principal men. The Assyrian, Israel's major foe in Micah's day, is probably best understood as representative of all of Israel's enemies, particularly those of the end times. Seven, eight, an idiom, for a full and sufficient number of leaders, more than enough for the task. For the task, look at Ecclesiastes chapter eleven, verse two. Jesus not only brings peace, but is the King of Peace. He is our peace. The Assyrians here are speaking of the worldly people who come against God's people. Seven means spiritually complete. This then is saying that the peace that Jesus brings is perfect and complete. Eight means new beginnings, and these are some of Jesus' subordinates spoke, spoken of here. Micah chapter 5 verse 6 reads, And they shall waste the land of Assyria with the sword, and the land of Nimrod in the entrances thereof. Thus shall he deliver us from the Assyrian when he cometh into our land, and when he treadeth within our borders. Nimrod. Nimrod is a reference to Assyria. Look at Genesis chapter 10 verse 11. Once again, Nimrod is a reference to Assyria that could possibly also include Babylon. Look at Genesis chapter 10 verse 10. The sword that Jesus fights with is the sword of his mouth. That is the word of God. Nimrod and Assyria here is speaking generally of the enemies of God's people. Verses 7 through 9. Israel's presence in the midst of many peoples would be to some a source of blessing. Look at Zechariah chapter, look at Zechariah chapters 8 through 22 and 23. To others, she would be like a lion, a source of fear and destruction. Look at Isaiah chapter 11 verse 14, Zechariah chapter 12 verses 2 and 3, Zechariah chapter 6. Excuse me, Zechariah chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, verse 6, and Zechariah chapter 14, verse 14. Micah chapter 5, verse 7. And the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many people as a dew from the Lord, 
as the showers upon the grass that tarrieth not for man, nor waiteth for the sons of men. Both the remnant which survived the sacking and burning of their city and temple and carried captive live in a scattered condition as the whole remnant according to the election of grace, whether of Jacob after the flesh or after the spirit. The Jews should, on their return from captivity, pour down their influence upon the nations as God sent showers upon the grass. So, through the dispersion of Jewish Christians on the death of Stephen, the Lord caused the knowledge of the truth with which the Jews were cloud charged to descend upon many people. Psalm 72 verse 6 reads, He shall come down like rain upon the mown grass as showers that water the earth. It shall be only the work of God. He shall by his immediate hand bless such as he alone without the help of man gives dew and showers. As this was fulfilled in the type before the gospel of the kingdom was preached to all nations. So it hath been and now is and ever shall be fulfilled in the ages to come. The remnant of Jacob is speaking of those who have received the Messiah. They actually are the spreaders of Christianity across the lands as dew would refresh the land. Most of the apostles of Christ were Hebrews. They carried the gospel message to the known world. The grace of God is a free gift from God poured out to all mankind. It was to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. All could be refreshed by this grace of God in Jesus Christ. Micah chapter 5 verse 8 reads, And the remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles in the midst of many people as a lion among the beasts of the forest, as a young lion among the flocks of sheep, who, if he go through, both treadeth down and teareth in pieces, and none can deliver. And the remnant for strength and courage which the beasts of the forest dare not oppose and cannot resist. This seems to be a prediction of what was to be effected in the times of the Maccabees and those following them, when the Jewish people gained great advantages over the Idumeans, Moabites and Ammonites, Samaritans, and so on and so forth. There is righteous wrath as well as all embracing mercy with God. Christ whose graciousness is likened to the dew and its gentleness to the lamb is at the same time the lion of the tribe of Judah. At the opening of the sixth seal, the kings of the earth and great men are represented as in extreme terror at the wrath of the lamb. Look at Revelation chapter 6 verse 16. None can deliver. None can deliver. That dares attempt to rescue but the prey is left under the lion's paw to satisfy the hungry beast. So shall Israel be after their return out of captivity, and while they keep the ways of the Lord, so they were in Esther's time against such as would have destroyed them. So in the Maccabees time, when they subdued the nations about them, but the conquering power of the word, the rod of Christ's strength, doth greater wonders than the sword of the, Macca of the Maccabees ever did. It is the mighty conquering power of the gospel that is here shadowed forth to us. And none can deliver, and none can deliver. Brings it to the ground at once, tramples upon it, and tears it in pieces as its prey. And none in the flock, or to whom it belongs, can deliver out of his hand. The Lamb of God, that's Jesus Christ, is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Jesus is the judge of all the world. He is strong and protective to those who accept him. He is also the destroyer of those who totally reject him. Luke chapter 19 verse 27 reads, But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. Micah chapter 5 verse 9 reads, Thine hand shall be lifted upon, up upon thy ad, up, 
Let me start over here. Micah chapter 5 verse 9 reads, Thine hand shall be lifted up upon thine adversaries, and all thine enemies shall be cut off. All thine enemies. This absolute and complete peace has never yet been experienced by Israel. This points to the millennial kingdom when the Prince of Peace shall reign, having conquered the nations. In verse 15, Jesus had a gentle, loving, forgiving, forgiving side of him. He also had a side that spoke strongly to the money changers in the temple. His righteous indignation drove the money changers out. He is our Savior who forgives and gives us new life, but he is also the king who rules with an iron hand. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 25 reads, For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. Micah chapter 5, verse 10 reads, And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, that I will cut off thy horses out of the midst of thee, and I would destroy thy chariots. In that day, in that day, the future kingdom is in view. Israel had been forbidden the use of cavalry. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 16. Once again, Israel had been forbidden the use of cavalry, lest they trust in earthly forces rather than God. Look at 1 Kings chapter 10, verses 26 and 28. God will remove all implements in which they trust, so the people, stripped of all human resources, rest only on him. War instruments will have no place in the time of peace. The day spoken of here is when Jesus reigns as king. God had never wanted his people to trust in their horses and chariots. There will be no need for them. Jesus has won the war. Victory is in Jesus. Verses 11 through 14. Cut off the cities, strongholds, continuing the thought from verse, from verse 10. Fortified cities were designed for defense. Their strength tempted people to put their trust in them rather than in God alone. Look at uh, chapter 1, verse 13, Psalm 27, verse 1, Hosea chapter 10, verses 13 and 14. People will live in peace in unwalled villages. Look, Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 11. The cities are also associated with centers of pagan worship. Uh, look at verse 14 and Deuteronomy 16, chapter 16, verse 21. The cities are also associated with centers of pagan worship, the worship of Asherah, the Canaanite goddess of fertility and war. All forms of self-reliance in war and idolatrous worship will be removed so that the nation must rely solely on Christ their King for deliverance and worship Him alone. Micah chapter 5 verse 11 reads, And I will cut off the cities of thy land and throw down all thy strongholds. Fenced cities and the other paraphernalia of war will be unnecessary in the Messiah's kingdom. They shall not learn war anymore. That's Micah chapter 4 verse 3. Demolish all thy forts and watchtowers and frontier guards. These here mentioned are means of defense against enemies' assaults in which Israel had too much trusted. The others before mentioned, Micah chapter 5 verse 10, are offensive preparations for annoying the enemy. But in the day of that peace here spoken of, there should be no enemy should invade the people of God to put them on their defense, nor should they have any need to attempt upon their enemies. And though these means are lawful to be used, yet shall it be the happiness of God's people not to need them. For their God, their Lord, is their Savior in the midst of them, and he will cut off enemies round about them, so that virtually this is a promise to Israel that their adversaries should be destroyed, and so their fears disappear. This is speaking of the glory of the cities and the formalities of government. There will be no threat of war, so there will be no need for strongholds. Micah chapter 5 verse 12 reads, And I will cut off witchcrafts out of thy hand, 
and thou shalt have no more soothsayers. The very art shall be out of use, and none shall openly as formally consult with them, or they make profession of foretelling events, or what a lucky day or hour to set upon an enterprise, or to curse, as Balaam would have done, an enemy to make way for victory. No more of these. The oracle ceased when Christ was born. Much to this purpose, look at Zechariah chapter 13 verse 2 and Malachi chapter 3 verse 5. The oracle ceased when Christ was born. Much to this purpose, God will, in mercy to his people, take away these stumbling blocks, these occasions of sin. This is some of the things that had misled God's people. Magic and sorcery, witches and warlocks are all part of of the witchcraft mentioned here. These things are an abomination to God. Soothsayers were just as bad. In fact, they were about the same. We could possibly add enchanter or mind reader or hypnotist, or hypnotist to that list. Micah chapter 5 verse 13 reads, Thy graven images also will I cut off, and thy standing images out of the midst of thee, and thou shalt no more worship the work of thine hands. The former was such as was made of wood or stone. The latter statutes, such as were molten or cast, and made of gold, silver, or brass, such as the Jews sometimes worshipped and are now found in the apostate church of Rome, but will have no place in the Christian churches, or those so-called in the latter day. The Jews indeed have had no idols or idolatrous worship among them since the Babylonish since the Babylonish captivity. And the prophet here speaks not of what would be found among them and removed at their conversion, but of what was in his time or had been or would be again, but should not be in future time when they should turn to the Lord and be like do among the people. And so we are to understand some following passages as not to fall down to idols and worship them, so neither to trust in carnal privileges, ceremonial rites, observances of the traditions of the elders, or any works of righteousness done by them which they had been prone unto. Anything you make with your hands or can see with your physical eye is not God. God is spirit, idolatry, worship of images of false gods is the very thing that had caused separation from God. God himself will destroy all of them. Micah chapter 5 verse 14 reads, And I will pluck up thy groves out of the midst of thee, so will I destroy thy cities. The groves where some of them abused and downright idolatrous worship, others of them used superstitiously, thus beside the word, the other way quite against the word. But after the return from Babylon, there was a great reformation in this point. And after the appearing of the Messiah, there has been a greater eradication of idolatry. Groves and cities. The groves are the idolatrous symbol of Astarte. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 16 verse 21, 2 Kings chapter 21 verse 7. Cities being parallel to groves must mean cities in or near with which, near which such idolatrous groves existed. Compare city of the house of Baal in Second Kings chapter 10, verse 25. That is a portion of the city sacred to Baal. The groves were some of the places where the worship of false gods went on. Notice, God destroys these places. The cities involved in this are thy cities that he destroys. Micah chapter 5, verse 15 reads, and I will execute vengeance in anger and fury upon the heathen, such as they have not heard. God speaks to our capacity. He will proceed or act as the Hebrew word signifies. He is supreme judge to whom vengeance belongs. And when he hath passed the sentence and his instruments executed, he takes it to himself. So when the Babylonians avenged the wrongs by the Assyrians done to the Jews, and when Cyrus with his Persians and Medes avenged the injuries of Babylon, 
this prophecy was partly fulfilled, and in succeeding times it was further fulfilled, and is now fulfilling, and so will be until the final destruction of the wicked. Anger and fury is spoken after the manner of man. It includes the greatness of God's just displeasure and the effects of it, which are resembled to what we do when furiously angry, act with utmost strength, and in the most terrible manner we can. God will, with as great severity and terror as flesh and blood can bear, proceed against these heathens, such as they have not heard with unparalleled terror, and so they shall be made warning pieces to others. This is speaking of the wrath of God, which comes on all who reject Jesus. Second Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 8 reads, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is three and a half years of torment from God on those who totally reject Jesus. This has been Empty Cross Ministries Daily Devotional Time. I'm Brother David. The name of the program is KJV Exposed. Once again, I would encourage you to read along with and follow along with Empty Cross Ministries uh, Daily Bible Reading Plan. Once again, that can be found on our website at EmptyCrossMinistries.com, Empty Cross Ministries Facebook page, Empty Cross Ministries Facebook, Empty Cross Ministries Group Facebook page, as well as my own personal Facebook page. Let's close out here with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your preserved word. We ask that you open our hearts and our minds that we be receptive to what you have to say to us through the minor prophet Micah. Father, help us to understand how to apply these principles to our daily lives, that we might be blessed by you in doing that. Father, once again, forgive us when we fall short of your glory, whether it be in word, thought, or deed. Father, help us to understand what you have to say to us to say to us in your preserved word. We ask these things in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Folks, stay safe, be blessed, stay in the word, and write the word upon your heart. Until next time, when we'll be looking at Micah chapter 6.